It's another glorious morning that our Heavenly Father has given us so that we might come together in this fashion to study His wonderful Word. As has been, has been mentioned earlier, we do have several who we ask for you to continue to remember in your prayers, continue to pray for them, and pray they might have a full recovery back to the fullest portion of their health. If you're visiting here with us, we want you to know that you're a welcome guest. We invite you to come back at any opportunity you might have. If you see something or hear something that sparks a question, please don't hesitate to come up and ask us. And I've got a question for Matthew. Are you staring at my, my remote control there on the Lord's Supper table? Would you stare at it and grab it, please? He was looking right at it, I thought. Thank you very much. So we're sitting there and during the Lord's Supper, and Rhonda says, You're remote. That's not on. Anyway. I said, No problem, I got it. Mike will do it. Mike's grabbed it before and put it up here. I thought, Mike's got it. And so I'm sitting there and, okay, don't forget the remote. Don't forget the remote. Guess what I forgot? So. This morning we're going to talk about, which is, it is a very important subject, as all subjects are that pertain to our souls. But it's one that should be a natural consequence of our lives as Christians. A natural result of us living our lives faithfully before the Lord in the world that we live in today. You know, we have the answers to a lot of problems. We have the solution to an inner turmoil. We have the, the ability to overcome great challenges because we know who our shepherd is and we follow him. We know how to make the right decisions, even when things become difficult. We know when things fall apart, not to give up. And the world sees this. And naturally, they should be drawn towards a life that we are living that provides them with these answers and helps them and shows them how to overcome the problems that they face. This morning we're going to be talking about the subject of drawing people to Christ. Of drawing people to Christ. Now, it's it's very simple. Like I said, this should be a natural consequence of our lives or a natural result of our lives as Christians. Yes, we should be willing to talk to other people and study with them. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But our lives should be lived in such a way that people, when they see us, they should see that something is different that we walk a bit differently, that we live our lives by a higher standard, and it should catch their attention. Sometimes it does for the worse, but we're hoping for the better. So the way this is all done is first off we recognize that as Christians that we are children of God by the spirit of adoption because of Jesus Christ. He came into this world, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, he died upon the cross, initiating the the new covenant by which we are saved by his blood. And as a result of him being the light, when we become children of God, we become the source of light for people within the world. We need to, as Jesus will say over in Matthew 15, verses 13 through 16, we let our light shine before men. Note there with me. Here in Matthew puts this conversation fairly, we assume, fairly early on in the teachings of Christ. And in Matthew chapter 5, note there in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, the light here, I believe that Jesus is talking about, is the light that emanates from us when we walk faithfully before him. When we follow, he, when we follow him, which is the light, then our life is lived in such a way that we serve as a light to the people who are around us. 
People who are living in a dark world, they, they, they look to us. They, they look at the light that is seen within our lives, within our actions, within our behaviors, within our mannerisms. They see the light within us. And it is natural because we are, according to what Jesus says, we are sons of light. Turn with me to John chapter 12. I mean, if Jesus, who is the light, came into this world and was made flesh, and the word that he taught became the light and the life of men, well, no wonder. Notice what he says here in John 12, verse 35. He makes the point there that a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. We follow the light. We recognize from John 1, beginning in verse 1, that Jesus was the light and the darkness was unable to comprehend it. We live within a world that is absent the light. World that chooses not to follow Christ, but yet our goal is to live our lives in such a way as Jesus told the Pharisees, consider his works and believe his works. And they were from God. Well, when people look at our lives, maybe, maybe initially in our studies with them, they don't quite see what we're trying to show them. At least let them look within our lives and see a behavior that is above the world. And we're not talking about elitism. We're simply talking about a behavior that is better than that of the world. It's a higher standard to which we follow. Many times people talk about buying products. And it's interesting. You can go into one store and pay 50 bucks for a product and go into another store and pay $1 for a product that's supposed to be the same thing. And someone say, why should I buy this one and not this one? Or why should I go for this one and not that one? And many times people buy based on quality, not necessarily the price. Over the course of time, this company has proven to have a solid quality standard, whereas this one just produces as many as they can without a quality standard. We understand that concept. So our behavior should be established within a quality, a standard that is higher than that which the world would establish. We are the sons of light. We are to be walking as children of light. The idea of walking here is the idea of our behavior. It is the way that we live our life. It is the path that we walk within our life and how we are around other people. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, we start there in verse 8. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He says, walk as children of light. It's not coincidence that Paul makes the connection with the teachings of Jesus and in regarding to him being the light and us being sons of light. He says in verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Then he continues, Finding out what is acceptable in the Lord. He says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of, look at the opposite here, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And so he continues with this idea of us living our lives, walking by the light, avoiding the darkness. Therefore our light, our behavior, our mannerisms, our obedience to God exposes that which is dark. You think about how our light shines to those who are living in this dark world. There are three different ways people can look at us and see the light that is shining from us. They, first of all, they look at our life. They look, they, they look at the way that we live. They look at the decisions that we make. They, they look at what is important to us versus what maybe they might find within what they might find important within their own lives. And they see how this importance alters the way that we behave ourselves, the way that we live our lives. Uh, a preacher friend of mine out in, out in um, Oregon, he's preaching a sermon this morning about our lives as Christians regarding in the workforce. You think about that. Whenever you go to work, does your life as a Christian have anything to do with the way that you work and how you work? Well, absolutely. I mean, there's a direct application. There's nowhere within our life that we can say, okay, I know I'm a Christian, but I'm going to set, take that hat off and put it right here, and now I'm going to do whatever I want to do. There's nowhere in our life 
not in our family, not in our jobs, not in schools, where we can do that. And so when we live our lives and we engage in the proper works and we, we, we have the proper behavior within our lives, people see us and they see the light. Let our light show science, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Because our ultimate goal by leading someone to Christ is that they may obey his gospel's call into salvation and become one of God's children. So we let our light shine before men. There's, there's something else that we do that helps to, to uh, draw others to Christ. And that is the fruit that we bear. We're supposed to bear fruit that is indicative of one who is a child of God. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Jesus talks about he is the vine and we are the branches. And notice as we read through this what he expects of us. John chapter 15, let's look at first off in verses 1 and 2. He says, I am the true vine and and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. All right, now, notice in verse 5, continuing. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And then verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So we see the imagery here, the idea of Christ is the vine and we are the branches. Think about a grapevine. All right, think about a grapevine. And the way it was explained to me, when you look at the, the bunch of grapes, that the, what he calls you are the branches, the branches are the bunch upon which the grapes grow. All right, and so you have the vine, you have the branches, you have the bunch that you have the branches and they bear the fruit within that. Well, this is what God expects of us. He expects of us being the branches to bear much fruit for him. Christ is the vine. We are the branches. We bear the fruit. And when we stop and consider how this affects our lives, consider, if you would, Matthew chapter 7, Verses 17 through 20. This is it's one of those things that sounds really good in concept, but it's the application that really makes it significant to our lives. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning there in verse 17, start kind of in the middle of this discussion. He says, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Now, in the analogy of the vine, it was talking about bearing fruit or not bearing fruit. Well, here we have a tree that bears bad fruit or a tree that bears good fruit. And the tree that bears bad fruit is removed. It is cut down. And so the fruit that we are to bear is the fruit that comes from within our heart and is directly affected by our heart. We can either be approved by God by what's within our heart or we defile ourselves based on what's within our heart. Christ talks about that. And so this is the idea of us living our lives in such a way that when people look within our lives, the fruit of our lives is what they see. And if that fruit is good, then that's wonderful. If the fruit comes because we are branches and he is the vine, then that is the way that it is supposed to be. Christ is the vine. Our fruit must be good. And you think about it, he says that my father is the vine dresser. Well, our being the branches of the vine, we are cultivated to bear good fruit by God's word. It's one of the things I find amazing about Galatians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 3. You look at those verses, those passages. And they tell us how to live. They they make the application. He says, you know, okay, no longer do this, but you need to do this. You need to put away this, and you need to start doing this. 
It's not some obscure abstract idea of Christianity and how it should change our lives. It tells us how to change our lives. And so if I'm a faithful child of God, there are certain things I'm not going to do. But there are certain things that I am going to certainly do. And this is what's cultivated by God's Word. This is what causes us to bear the proper fruit. And this is our charge. Our charge of faithfulness is to bear the fruit that God finds acceptable. Now, I want to step aside from the direction of the lesson for just a moment and share this with you. If you've been in our Isaiah study on Wednesday nights, You'll remember Isaiah chapter 5 and the song, the song of the vine, or the song of the vineyard. And notice here in Isaiah chapter 5, be turning there, I couldn't help but think about this. In preparing this lesson in regards to him, Jesus being the vine, and we are the branches, and we are to bear good fruit. Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah, the Lord is very disappointed with Israel and very disappointed with Judah. And listen briefly, it's a short, short chapter, just seven verses. Now let me sing to my beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst. He also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done, that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please tell me, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns, and I also command the clouds that they rain, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. See, here's the thing about this. The nation of Judah was the vine. And as the vine, they should have been bearing the proper fruit that God had established for them. But instead, they bore wild fruit. Jesus is the true vine. Israel and the leaders failed in their responsibility. They rejected God. Jesus is the true vine. And since he's the true vine, if we are the offspring of this true vine, by our adhering to his word and submitting unto his leadership, then we will bear the proper fruit. We cannot but help to bear this fruit. So I said, well, it's the natural part of our lives as Christians. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it is kind of like, like odor. Think about odor for just a moment. Um, you can always tell you walk into a house where the mother's been cooking all day. I mean, you smell it five feet from the door. You go up, and, and it smells like whatever she's cooking. I, I like the smell of roast. That smells really, really good. Fried potatoes and pinto beans, they smell good too. You smell that. But you can also smell when the sewer backs up into the house. Yeah, I just messed up one bad imagery, one good imagery, didn't I? You, you know that idea. You go up to the house, and before you walk through the front door, you know something's wrong. Something has gone horribly wrong in the house. Either it's a bad potato or the sewer's backed up in the house. Automatically, we know what's good, what's bad, what is preferred, what is definitely not wanted. Well, this is the way our lives as Christians are. We are the salt of the earth. We are a light into the world. We are, in, are a good odor, if you would. We're supposed to be. So the world would find it pleasing, not by the world standard, but by that which God has established. And so what happens is, when we let our light shine before men and we bear fruit, we end up planting the word of God. We end up planting that his word, which is the seed. Our light and our fruit, they draw people to Christ. They draw them to him 
through us. Now, I'm not trying to say, you know, I don't have to teach anybody. I just have to live a good life and my evangelistic efforts is done. No, I'm not saying that. The light and the fruit should at least give them or hopefully be some sort of reinforcement when you say to them, let's study God's word. Let's consider what his word has to say. Christ illustrated the challenges, of course, of, of sowing, but we have to take the opportunity to do the best that we can, to take the seed and to plant the seed in hopes that God may give the increase. The Apostle Paul, in talking about his and Apollos' efforts in the kingdom, neither one of them was better than the other, neither one of them was great. One planted, the other watered, but God gave the increase. And the word, that, that, that seed that they planted, is that word of God. And so what happens in our lives as Christians, if we are living our lives the way that we should, then we, we take the opportunity to say, hey, would you like to come to services? Or would you like to study? The person may say to themselves, you know, this might be the one I want to study with. This person seems to have their act together as far as what is right and what is wrong in their behavior. Whereas if our life said, if we were a liar, if we were a thief, you know, if we're filled with hatred, you know, and, and our, our, our language is filled with vulgarity, and we come to someone and say, you know, by the way, we got a gospel meeting coming on. Why don't you come, come to church with me? Say, what church do you go to? <laughs> they let you do a lot, and my church doesn't. Because you're living a life that's not reflective of Christianity. I mean, most people in the denominational world will recognize there is a measure of difference. Some have really loosened the standard and lowered it. But most of them, when they look at the Scriptures, recognize there is a better way to live. And this is the way that Christians are supposed to live. But it only comes when the Word is implanted. When we sit down and we study the Word of God and we take the Word of God and we are convicted by the Word of God and we let the Word of God change our life so that the light that we admit, the fruit that we bear, is what God requires of us. James talks about this implanted Word. Turn with me, if you would, to James chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 21. James chapter 1, let's start our reading there in verse 18. And we'll read down through verse 21. All right, notice here James says, beginning in chapter 1, there in verse 18. Now notice as James proceeds with this. He says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now think about everything we've talking about the role that Jesus played, his word that he taught, what his apostles taught. This word, he says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This is the change that takes place. This is the change that takes place when we plant the Word of God into our hearts, to our minds. And when we plant the Word of God into the hearts and the minds of those who are still lost in sin. It may be that you might live your life and not have an individual ever come up to you and say, Hey, you, I see you live such a good life. Can you tell me why? But at least, if they do, you'll know how to answer them. So the question we have is, are we drawing people to Christ? Do people in, look into our lives and see a behavior that is above that of the world, that is something different, something to be desired, something that brings peace into your life? Do they look at it and see a light that is shining or the proper fruit being born? Do they look within your life and do they see you as someone that they might be willing to study with? Creating an opportunity for you to sit down and study with them from the Word of God. The only way, though, that we can do this, and this will happen when we strive to live faithfully, we're going to be ready to stand. We'll be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. 
Peter talks about. We'll be able to take a stand, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, and tell those about salvation found in Christ. Now, listen, if you're not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel's call into salvation, but you, you have to be convicted that Christ is the Son of God and that He is the solution to the problem of sin within your life and that if you'll repent and be baptized, then God will forgive you of your sins. Are you willing to do that today? If you are a Christian and maybe you've not been living faithfully, maybe the light went out some time back, maybe you've stopped bearing fruit, Maybe you're bearing the wrong type of fruit. Then it's time to repent. Be cultivated by the word. Be cultivated by God through his word. Let your heart turn back to the Lord. Turn away from the sin and be restored to his fellowship this morning. This is something that you can do if it is what you want to do. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.